And now for a special ground report from the U.S. As we track Prime Minister Modi's state visit, we also reported on issues that make news in America. Obviously, guns featured in our list. America's love for guns is well known. What is equally obvious is its reluctance to crack down on gun violence. Gun control is a deeply divisive issue in the United States. And as mass shootings continue unabated, the biggest casualty seems to be school children. I visited a shooting range in Virginia to find out why guns are so integral to the American identity and to better understand America's toxic love affair with its guns. Here's a report. It is a weekday in America. Most Americans are at work, but not these. These men and women chose to come to a gun rage instead to practice their shooting skills. We are in Richmond, some 40 miles from Washington, D.C. This is the capital of the American state of Virginia. And we're here at a shooting range. We'll speak to people here to try to understand why the average American takes up guns. Guns are a divisive subject in the U.S. But at this gun range in Virginia, there is no ambiguity or debate. Guns are a way of life here a social glue that binds communities together. And this fact hits you at the entrance door itself. Look at this. This is an ad for a gun, Glock firearms. And nowhere else have I seen something like this, uh, ads for firearms and weapons uh, so openly and frequently displayed in civilian spaces. This is America for you. It's a country which has more guns than people, uh, which has had more than one incident of mass shooting every day in this year. Uh, gun, guns are a very politically divisive issue and a very important issue in America. Uh, this is the only country, I think, which has such frequent incidents of school shootings. And yet, this is a subject that continues to divide American people, and they have very strong opinions on whether or not they should have the right to bear arms. Despite all the gun violence and repeated instances of deadly mass shootings, there is no change in the attitude of gun owners. For most, owning a gun is a necessity, including our trainer of the day, David Phillips. So you guys are going to need to rent uh, safety um, goggles once or to, to go onto the range. Um, you and I are fine. Uh, it'll reflect. He's 67 years um, old, worked so, as a software yeah, developer for three decades, served um, in the Navy for a brief while, and is now a granddad and a gun trainer. Um, Phillips takes us inside the gun range. We are greeted with sounds of gunfire and messages from pro-gun lobbies. Buy a gun for America. Guns save lives. For God and country. Stickers like these can be found everywhere. At the counter, there are guns of all shapes and sizes, of all descriptions. I've been using these since 45 years ago in the Navy. And they work really well, so you get them as small as you can. And then I always find it easier to pull back on your ear. Our trainer has picked a range. He asks us to cover our ears before entering the firing zone. For you? It's a, a double lock door. As the doors open, the sound of gunfire gets louder. Empty bullet shells are flying in every direction. Our crew cautiously makes its way to range number 13. Phillips wastes no time. He swiftly loads his magazine and starts shooting. He insists that we give it a shot too. It's way off the mark, though. We know we are better off shooting questions than bullets. Sometimes. The whole experience is a bit unsettling, to see people casually firing weapons like it were a game of ping pong. But for Phillips, it's second nature. He started shooting at the age of 11. He began training his son at the age of six. Did it 
at any point occur to you that it may be strange or odd for an 11 year old to be handling an actual gun and learning to shoot it? No. And the reason for that is I was always under my father's very close supervision. Um, and with a, uh, with a rifle, especially, um, if I started to swing it, you know, with, so with a handgun. So I get, I get the yeah. safety part, yeah. but I'm, I'm saying that as a concept. No. Um, I it, mean, it was, we were, you know, had paper targets downrange, and it, it, was, it was just a, a skill. Um, like, I mean, it's, a, it's an Olympic sport. It is, it yeah. is, but uh, not, for, not for kids. Uh, not for kids, but not many kids are in the Olympics either. Our conversation, in a nutshell, captures America's gun debate. A large section of people are convinced that guns should be a part of daily life. No wonder this country has more guns than people. Last year, there were almost 400 million guns in circulation. That's 120 guns for every 100 Americans, the highest rate in the world. The number of gun owners is still rising. The reason is the fractured nature of America's politics. More and more Americans now want firearms. Their demand rose during the pandemic, when close to 60 million guns were sold to Americans. Phillips meets many of these new gun owners. He leads training for the Liberal Gun Club. It's a group of left-leaning gun owners, and their tribe is growing. It's upstairs. It sounds like it's upstairs. With the surge in violence and mass shootings and the impasse over gun regulation, the left believes that being armed is now vital. Trainers like Phillips take the argument a step further. They link gun ownership to fundamental rights. Self-defense is a human right. The potential victim has the human right to respond with force in kind. There are about 400 million firearms in the United States. You think that should change? No. Yes, more. You, you uh, should, there should be more? Sure. Why? And the reason is there are about 600,000 negative outcomes, and that includes um, homicides, suicides, accidents. And when you take 600,000 and you divide it by 400 million, that's a very, 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 very small percentage of neg negative outcomes. So far, that hasn't been the case. We are midway through 2023, and the tally for mass shootings has crossed the 300 mark. If the present trend continues, the U.S. could set a new record. 2023 will be the worst year in recent memory for gun violence. The fact is, more guns are not helping America. They're feeding into the epidemic of violence. We begin with the biggest global headline, a revolt against Vladimir Putin, the biggest challenge to his rule. Vladimir Putin has been in power for 23 years. He's not faced anything like this before, an unprecedented coup that lasted 36 hours. It was led by this man, Yevgeny V. Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner Group, also known as Putin's chef. This is a story that Hollywood would scramble to buy rights for, a strongman leader versus his own aid. A private army marching towards the capital, reinforcements made to stop their march, and deals being broken behind the scenes. At the end, the revolt may have ended, the rebel may have been banished, but it's left Russia in an extraordinary crisis. More on that later. First, let's tell you how the rebellion unfolded. What exactly happened in those 36 hours? It all began on Friday with this video. A 30-minute long video. At first glance, it looked like any other Wagner rant because Prigozhin has criticized the Russian military before, multiple times. But this video was different. This time, the Wagner chief sounded very angry. He questioned the Kremlin's operations. He slammed the defense minister of Russia, and he said that the Ukraine war was based on lies. The war was not needed in order to return the Russian citizens to Abosom, and not in order to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. It was needed for one star with additional embroidery so that one mentally sick man could look good on a coffin pillow. You heard that. Those accusations are damning. And of course, Moscow would not have any of that. So Russian agencies scrambled into action. They ordered for his immediate arrest. And this is where things start to boil over. 
Prigozhin said his fighters were approaching Rostov-on-Don. So Moscow sent troops there. Irrespective, Wagner forces took the city and they faced virtually no resistance. So by Saturday, they'd captured one Russian city. Riding high on their victory, they decided to aim for Moscow next, the capital of Russia. A huge column of Wagner vehicles set off for the capital. This is not a military coup. It is a march for justice. Our actions do not in any way interfere with troops. Obviously, the Kremlin was rattled. Moscow was their seat of power and the Wagner mercenaries were coming for it. So Putin decided to address the nation. He called it a stab in the back for the country. Listen to this. We won't let it repeat a civil war. We will protect our people and our statehood from any threats, including treason from the inside. What we are facing now is treason. Unreasonable ambitions and personal interests lead to treachery, state treason and betrayal of own people and the common cause which Wagner fighters and commanders fought for along and died for alongside with other units and brigades. But even this failed to stop Wagner. By Saturday afternoon, they were less than 400 kilometers away. So the Wagner army is marching on. They're just hours away from the capital. At a later point, they're some 250 kilometers away. That's when the unexpected happens. Prigozhin hits the mission abort button. Why? Apparently to avoid bloodshed. The Wagner chief says a compromise was brokered, not by Putin, but by Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko. And what are the conditions of this deal? One, Wagner forces will halt their march. Two, Prigozhin would leave for Belarus. Three, a criminal case against him would be dropped. And four, those who joined the rebellion would not be prosecuted. These were the terms of the deal. Prigozhin was last seen in an SUV on Saturday night. He was leaving the town that he'd captured, Rostov on Don. Some local people were seen cheering for him. Others shook his hand through the car window. Meanwhile, the Wagner mercenaries headed back to their base. And just like that, the rebellion was over. It ended as suddenly as it began. At least for now, it's ended. But this wasn't just any other revolt. It was the biggest challenge yet to Putin's rule. It was Russia's most serious security crisis since 1999. And remember, all this was happening while Russia is still at war in Ukraine. So Moscow had to divert resources from there to protect its own territory. Putin had to move forces to protect himself from a private army that he helped create. Which brings us to the most crucial question. Where does this leave the Russian president? Has his hold on power weakened? Has this shattered his image of invincibility? Putin appeared on TV on Saturday. He appeared again in a Kremlin video address today. But he's not been seen in public since. No one knows where he is, really. Many say he escaped from the capital. They claim that Putin flew to a secret place, a palace in Valdai. The seriousness of what has happened in Russia cannot be overstated. Putin's inner circle is very crucial for him. It is the key to keeping him in power. And Prigozhin was part of this inner circle. He was a close confidant until he decided to revolt. It seems Putin underestimated him. He could have stopped this with a phone call, but the fact is, he did not. It was Lukashenko who had to step in. So clearly, this is a challenge to Putin's leadership. His strongman image has taken a hit, and many expect him to retaliate either militarily or individually against those who took part in this revolt. Does that mean Prigozhin is not safe anymore? Well, technically, he's a free man, but now he has a target on his back. And what about his band of fighters, the Wagner group? What happens to them? They've been fighting Putin's war in Ukraine. In fact, they play a very key role there in the war in Ukraine. This private army has long had Moscow's blessing. Not anymore. Wagner's future looks uncertain now. It's hard to say what will become of the fighters or the impact that this will have on the war in Ukraine. Russia insists there will be none. That this rebellion will have no impact on the war, but that's a hard sell. Moscow has been dealing with infighting between Wagner and its military for a while now. And now it's, it's had to deal with a mutiny. This definitely helps Ukraine. And while Putin seems to have been caught off guard, it looks like the West may have known something. U.S. Intel, for instance, says that there were signs of a mutiny. A key trigger was a decree issued by Moscow on the 10th of June. It ordered all volunteer detachments to sign contracts with the government. This included the Wagner Group. What it basically means is this. 
There was going to be a takeover, a takeover of the Wagner mercenaries. There were signals that something was up in Russia. Then why did Moscow not act? It's one of the many unanswered questions here. The rebellion may have ended, like I said, but the cracks are showing. It could pose a challenge to Russia and to Putin's leadership. For our next story, brace yourselves for a Zucker punch. Pardon the pun because I'm going to tell you about two tech bros gone rogue. Tesla CEO Elon Musk and Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. The world's richest person and the world's richest millennial. One age 52, the other 39. Now why is their age relevant here? To reiterate the fact that these two billionaires are fully grown men. And to prepare you for what I'm about to tell you. Musk and Zuckerberg have agreed to a cage fight. That's right. They each want to stand in a red and blue corner and fight each other. Now, fighting used to be a way out of poverty for some. Look at all these all-time boxing greats. Manny Pacquiao, Mike Tyson, Floyd Patterson. They grew up in destitution and fought their way out of it quite literally. So it's obvious why this news sounds odd. Why do two men who have a combined wealth of $340 billion want to beat each other up physically? Is it a plea for attention, a cry for help? Both competitors have amassed unimaginable riches, so presumably they're now staring at a perplexing question. Does wealth truly make a life meaningful? Well, I'm not sure if this fight screams midlife crisis or if it's a joke, but I'll tell you the facts here. Reports say Meta is developing a social media platform like a rival to Twitter. And Twitter, we know, is owned by Elon Musk. So he responded to a post about this news, about Meta's plans. And he said he would be up for a cage match with Zuckerberg. Guess what? Zuckerberg responded. And instead of saying, that's insane, which many would expect, Zuckerberg responded by saying, quote unquote, send me location. Short, crisp and bizarre. So the pair have now agreed to fight at the Vegas Octagon. It's said to be an ultimate fighting championship arena. Now, it's still unclear if and when the fight will take place, but people are already betting on who will win. They're putting their money on Zuckerberg. After all, he's quite the jiu-jitsu aficionado. And Musk claims he almost never works out, except for picking up his kids and throwing them in the air. But remember, he has at least 10 children, so it can be quite the workout. But then again, is it enough to win? We aren't holding our breath, really. Either way, the thing is that this fight is less about beating seven shades out of each other and more about their trifling differences rooted in the ongoing battle between their companies. So what if we pitted Meta and Tesla against each other, like a theoretical brawl? Well, Tesla is more likely to emerge victorious in this one, and I'll tell you why. Tesla, the electric vehicle maker, is valued at about $800 billion. That's $100 billion ahead of Meta. The social network company is larger by revenue, yes, but Tesla is growing at a faster rate. And the numbers speak for themselves. Meta made its stock market debut in 2012. A dollar invested in the company then, in 2012, amounts to $7.45 now. And the same dollar invested in Tesla at the same time, 2012, is at $144 now. But even so, here's the clincher. Both Musk and Zuckerberg want to reshape the world, so their companies, Tesla and Meta, reflect this aspiration. The problem is, Meta wants to achieve it through virtual reality. But there are bigger firms in the ring there, like Apple. And even upstarts like TikTok pose a threat. Plus, there are regulators who keep curbing Meta from gaining complete dominance. Meanwhile, Tesla's ride is relatively smooth and faster. It is transforming our physical world with vehicle charging networks and battery production operations to boot. Also, here's the catch. Governments want what Elon Musk is selling. So in the end, Tesla is more likely to dominate no matter who wins in that ring. But apparently, where's the fun without a black eye and a boosted ego? Meanwhile, in New Delhi, Barack Obama remains the big headliner. His criticism of India in an interview has led to a strong reaction. Last week, he spoke about the state of religious minorities in India and how the tension may break up the country. 
This, as expected, has not gone down well with New Delhi. The ruling party, the BJP, is going all guns blazing against the former US president. They say Obama bombed six Muslim countries, while Prime Minister Modi has been awarded by six Muslim countries. The latest one, by the way, is Egypt. The Indian Prime Minister was in Egypt over the weekend after wrapping up his state visit to America. It was the first visit by an Indian leader in a quarter of a century. He met President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He signed a pact on strategic partnership and was conferred with Egypt's highest civilian award. Here's a report. This is India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the Al-Hakim Mosque in Cairo, an 11th century mosque with great historic significance. It was restored by the Daudi Bohra community. This community has had a base in India since the 1500s. So when Prime Minister Modi visited the mosque and interacted with the community, it sent a strong message. A response to those who question India's treatment of religious minorities and proof of India's centuries-old cultural ties with Egypt. Here's another picture that burnished India's image. Its Prime Minister conferred with the Order of Nile Award. This is Egypt's highest state honour. And as its recipient, Prime Minister Modi joined an elite list that includes the likes of Nelson Mandela, former US President Jimmy Carter and Queen Elizabeth II. This couldn't have come at a more appropriate time. This was an Islamic country honouring Prime Minister Modi days after a former US President questioned his government's record on Muslims. In fact, this was the sixth Islamic country to award Prime Minister Modi, a statistic that his party is vigorously reiterating. But the visit to Cairo was about much more than this. It was the first bilateral by an Indian Prime Minister in 26 years. A short two-day visit, but it ticked all the right boxes. From exchanging light-hearted moments with the Indian community to serious talks with the top leadership of Egypt. He reflects the wise leadership and uh, for a country, for a big country like India, there is a great development in India. And also this reflects that he is always and continuously working there in India. Once the grand welcome was done, it was time for business. Prime Minister Modi met Egypt's President Abdel Fateh al-Sisi. Al-Sisi was also India's guest at the Republic Day Parade earlier this year. The two sides have elevated ties to a strategic partnership. They signed multiple pacts, including on agriculture, archaeology and antiquities and competition law. But before we understand what New Delhi and Cairo are planning for the future, we must know what they already have. India and Egypt go back a long way. They are among the world's oldest civilizations. One of the first references to relations with Egypt is from Ashoka's Edicts. Fast forward to 1947. India had just become an independent country. Less than three days after that, India established bilateral ties with Cairo. Then there was a non-aligned movement, or NAM. The world was divided into two camps during the Cold War. India's Jawaharlal Nehru and Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser founded NAM. Post-2014, the relationship took another turn. India began proactively engaging with the Arab world. In the case of Egypt, the focus has been on economic ties too. Reports say more than 50 companies have invested more than $3 billion in Egypt. India is one of the top five importers of Egyptian products. Bilateral trade stands at over $7 billion. They want to take it beyond $12 billion in the next five years. But the thrust going forward will be on the defence partnership. India is looking to boost its defence exports and Egypt is emerging as a willing buyer. From Tejas to Brahmo's missiles, there's talk of sale and technology transfer. This will help India in more ways than one. Egypt is a strong military power in the Arab world, a member of the Arab League and the OIC, or Organization of Islamic Countries. A deeper strategic relationship with Cairo serves many purposes for New Delhi. And images like these send a message to its critics. Herding, obedience, protection, racing, hunting. The list goes on. What am I talking about? Canine competitions. For many pooch lovers, they're quite a big deal. And our last story tonight is about one such recently held competition, a hunt for the world's ugliest dog. Yes, it is a thing. And a dog named Scooter has raised its way to the top with its reversed hind legs and loose tongue. Scooter has not only won people's hearts, but also $1,500 in prize money. The question is, does a dog ugliness contest even serve a purpose? He conquers all. 
Sparse mohawk-like hair with gravity-defying strands that stand high as if shocked. A rat-like tail, reverse legs, and a tongue that just won't stay in his mouth. This is Kuta, a real diamond in the rough, pardon the pun. And now he has been crowned champion of the world's ugliest dog contest. It's a world-renowned competition held annually in California in the US for the past 50 years. <laughs> now this contest may seem odd, but that's the point. It celebrates imperfection and dogs who had been counted out for their appearance. So pooches come from far and wide to compete for the coveted title, where they not only receive love and admiration, but also $1,500 as prize money. And sure, winning is exciting, even if it is in an ugly battle. But this contest is so much more, it promotes dog adoptions and showcases extraordinary canines who've defied adversity. Most of the dogs in this contest are rescues. Take Scooter, for example. He's seven years old and had a very tough life before he was adopted. When he was a pup, his breeder wanted him euthanized because he had a birth defect. His hind legs faced backwards. This meant he would never be able to walk. But that wasn't to be. Scooter was rescued. He found a good home. And with the help of therapy and a specialized cart, he's now able to move. According to judges, it was Scooter's determination that gave him an edge. But the fact is, most of these canine participants share a similar troubled history. So Prince came in uh, from the desert and was involved in a fight for food and he was the runt. So he got um, attacked here. So he's only got one eye. So he's missing this eye here. And one of his ears never really sticks up. And he's got this really long tongue. Um, so those are kind of his distinctive ugly features. And he loves belly rubs, as you can tell. <laughs> this is Harold Bartholomew. He's a, um, at least 17-year-old Chihuahua, um, a little rescue. He was actually dumped in a park. Um, and he was supposed to be out, like on hospice. They didn't think he was going to last long, and I adopted him, and I've had him for um, close to two years now. Now, dogs may be a man's best friend, but this friendship seems like a one-way street. Across the world, pets are being abandoned. Germany has the most number of homeless dogs, followed by UK and the US. India has a staggering 60 million homeless dogs. A number of these canines are euthanized, and even if they aren't abandoned, dogs are subjected to cruelty. They are starved, burnt, and even raped. But despite this, canines remain a popular choice for pets. And to give you an idea, the global pet market is valued at $260 billion, worth more than the solar and wind energy sectors combined. But more than humans, this costs the pets. Most people go to breeders to buy a dog whose supply comes from puppy mills, which are plagued by high mortality rates for the young and mothers are kept perpetually pregnant. Then they are discarded. Pedigreed animals are plagued by health problems because they have genetics similar to offsprings of siblings. And this is where the world's ugliest dog contest comes in. It shows people how they can save a life and do their bit to walk away from backyard breeding because the dogs may look ugly on the outside, but it is through no fault of their own, and they can still be man's best friend. It's huge, just being able to put it out there that, you know, you don't have to get an adorable little puppy. These guys have so much love to give. So think about it. As they say, adopt, don't shop, and save a friend's life. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Israeli lawmakers have begun debating a proposed judicial overhaul, sparking mass protests in the country. In Myanmar, authorities have torched seized illegal drugs worth $180 million to mark World Drug Day. And monsoon has arrived in India. The states of Haryana and Himachal Pradesh have witnessed flash floods and landslides, though. And finally, what makes June the 26th significant? We are going back to history, to the year 1945, when the UN Charter was signed by representatives of the 50 countries that were participating in San Francisco. It is the founding document of the United Nations. We'll leave you with these images. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Labor President Truman arrives to attend the last sale, and the world is now final signing of the chunk. The signing is a historic. Fellow delegates, if we had had this charter a few years ago. Lines of yet another mass shooting in America, gun terror. We're in Richmond, some 40 miles from Washington, D.C., and we're here at a shooting range. We'll speak to people here to try to understand why the average American takes up guns. Look at this. This is an ad for a gun. There are about 400 million firearms in the United States. There are about 600,000 negative outcomes. This is the only country, I think, which has such frequent incidents of school shootings. And when you take 600,000 and you divide it by 400 million, that's a very, 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 very small percentage negative outcome. This is America for you. It's a country which has more guns than people. 